Hi, this is Emily Freitag, and I'm so pleased today to be joined by Dr. Pamela Cantor, the founder and senior science advisor for Turnaround for Children. Um, and welcome to our Rethinking Intervention series, and thank you for joining us. Would thank love you, Emily. Would love to hear, um, as we have with all of our guests, your own learning story to start, and then we are eager to know what you have found in your research over time works and does not. Um, but please start with your own story. So Emily, there are a lot of reasons why a person would want to go to medical school and become a doctor. And mine were really clear. I went to medical school to learn about trauma, how it affects the body and the mind, because one day I was going to be a doctor and I would know how to heal children and help them recover from trauma. And this was because I had known trauma as a child. I grew up in a neighborhood with many cousins living nearby and there were always sleep sleepovers. And when I was six years old, my uncle visited the room where I was sleeping and sexually abused me. He let me know that this had to be our special secret. I still don't remember how many times it happened, but I do remember one thing, and that is that I was very afraid to tell my parents. So one night I had this dream in which I saw myself dying, and I knew it had to do with this not having told my parents and that I just had to have the courage to tell them. And he told me that I could never, my parents told me they, that I could never speak a word about this to anybody or the family would be hurt. And I remember even as a six-year-old, not understanding why they seemed mad at me and not him. After that, there was no protection for years. And my mother was so ashamed that she couldn't really care for me. And my father seemed angry all the time. So, they carried this through every single aspect of my childhood until literally the day they died. And on that final day, even though their deaths were separated by 10 years, their last words to me were the same. They both said, I'm sorry. I did eventually get help when I was 15 years old from this amazing psychiatrist who was a big man, a very big storyteller with a booming voice. And he told me that I was a pearl in an oyster, not this ugly, dirty thing that I thought I was. Now it's true, he could have made me believe anything, but basically it all boiled down to one thing and that I was good. And up until that point, I thought I was bad. So the day I came into his office and I said to him, you know, I'm gonna be a doctor. And he looked at me with this big smile and he said, of course you are. And I thought to myself, did he not know that up until that point I hadn't taken a single math or science course. I was an art major, but he had these magical powers and I figured he got them in med school. So I had to go to med school and get them too. And like everything else, he was the reason I wanted to go. And he was the person who made me believe I could do it. Thank you so much for sharing your story. So tell us um, from your own experience, um, that incredibly powerful personal story and from the research you've seen, what do you know to be true about what works in supporting student learning? Well, in a way, before we get to learning, I think we want to talk for a minute or two about what we know about the science of learning and development. Mm -hmm. Because I just told you a story from my life that included a very painful trauma and it absolutely disrupted my development. But the other thing that I hope you heard and others will hear in my story is that it wasn't permanent, mm -hmm. that the trauma became the inspiration 
for the purpose that my life has been dedicated to since then. But if this was before COVID and the events of the past few weeks and I had an opportunity to talk to you about human development, the development of the brain and learning science, I would have begun with this. Each of us has 20,000 genes in our genome. That's what each of us gets. Yet in our lifetime, fewer than 10% of these genes are going to be expressed. So what do you think determines what's in that 10%? It's actually context, the environments, experiences, and relationships of our lives. The context we're exposed to is the primary driver of who we become, including the expression of our genes. Mm -hmm. The risks and opportunities in development and evolution itself sit inside this one profoundly important point, that there is no separation between nature and nurture, biology and environment, brain and behavior, only a collaboration between them. And this means that our lives are not predetermined by a genetic program, that in fact, genes are chemical followers. They're little packages of protein covered with receptors that are triggered into expression by the environments, experiences, and relationships in our lives. So if nurture drives nature, this is both good and bad news, but it means that our brains are a living structure made up of tissue that is the most susceptible to change from experience of any tissue in the human body. The reason we can say that there are opportunities for growth in a time of crisis is because of our malleability as human beings. So today there is a pandemic inside the pandemic where the combined effects of COVID, economic hardship, racial injustice have dramatically escalated the inequities and magnified the uncertainties about what is ahead. That you have one in three parents of infants and toddlers skipping or reducing meals. Mm -hmm. That you have nine million students that don't have access to broadband. And all of this is concentrated in low-income communities are powerful in indicators of the injustices of today and the risks to health and academic growth that they carry. And the science of stress tells us that stress can get under the skin and into the brain and body because adversity doesn't just happen to children. It happens inside their brains and bodies through the biologic mechanism of stress. So the experience of stress is really the interplay between two biologic systems and hormones that are chemical messengers that carry messages to the brain to the very same structure, the limbic system. And what is that? That is the learning and emotion center of our brains. So one system's mediated by cortisol, which produces that fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. But the other is mediated by oxytocin, which is the hormone that produces love, attachment, trust, and safety. This hormone not only helps us manage stress, or protect us from the damaging effects of stress, it also produces resilience to future stress. So this hormone is the most powerful hormone and the human relationship, the most powerful example of context that can protect children from the damaging effects of stress. But we have a paradox now in COVID because what's happening is we're told that to be physically safe, we have to be physically distant from one another. So there's been a huge disruption in, in the social connectedness of kids' lives, mm -hmm. of which school is such an important part. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we have to maintain that connectedness by other means, and we are all trying to do that. And the best will always be when we're face to face, mm -hmm. but staying connected even virtually in a time of crisis will provide the emotional fuel we need to cope and surmount this. 
So the burden of stress to the body and the mind is something called allostatic load. And although this burden can be biologically embedded, the most important thing is the thing I said to you before. It's preventable, which is incredible, and it's reversible, which is even more incredible. So the research of people like Bruce McEwen and many others speak to the importance of activities that actually are under our control, that can help us harness the capacity of the brain to adapt, to demonstrate its plasticity, and to recover from the effects of stress. The balance between risk and protective factors in the environments that our young people and families are in can tip the balance between emotional vulnerability and mental health issues on the one side and physical wellness and resilience on the other. And this is the opportunity that we have today, both in policy, in practice, to use what we know to design environments that promote relationships, routines, and resilience, what Turnaround calls the new three R's, that actually trigger something called the upward spiral. And the upward spiral is a cascade of hormones and neurotransmitters that can be recruited to combat stress and promote resilience in environments that are designed to do just that. So that is a big primer on science. <laughs> but you now have the foundation and why I am hopeful during this time. Um, there's so much I took away from that and, and, and I'm learning in this conversation. Just to clarify, I want to make sure I'm understanding. So it's the same things that we would do to um, prevent risk and to recover. Is that mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, the, the focus that we have on relationships, which is the most powerful example we have of positive context, there is no more important thing that schools can focus on in September than deeply knowing their kids, what their kids have experienced, what their kids have learned during this time, there are kids that are taking care of their whole families. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, that's a trauma. But what does that teach a child mm -hmm. about what they're capable of? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so it would be horrible if we framed September in terms of losses. Mm -hmm. Okay, think mm -hmm. about every book you have ever read of a young person who has faced adversity and gone on to do incredible things. What is the one thing mm -hmm. that is true in every story? Challenge, it's, it's, part, it's part of the arc, right? Challenge is the arc and there's a person, there's a person who never gave up on them, mm -hmm. a person who had their back, a mm -hmm. person who knew they could do it. Yeah, it's like okay. um, the hero's journey, right? The mentor yes. figure, mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, fascinating. So can you take us deeper into relationship and into Absolutely. what, um, what makes for relationship effectiveness? Yep. Okay. So, I mean, there are a bunch of things that I want to do to intro that point. Um, not too many. But I do want to flag, and I know you know this, that there has been a false choice in education mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. between the things we need to do on social, emotional, and cognitive development, physical and mental health, and mm -hmm. the pursuit of academic ac excellence. Today we know there's a giant body of science that tells us that a healthy context for learning requires that we pay attention to young people's safety, health, mental health, social and emotional and cognitive, cognitive development, identity and agency, and their academic skill development. Not one of these things or two of these things, all of these things. Mm -hmm. It's all one developmental story. It's all one thing. That, all that has one been thing. 
a complete theme across all of these conversations. And to the extent that we can shatter the camps that we have known, I think there is abundant evidence that it is all inter interrelated. And Emily, all I can tell you is the importance of the sentences you just said, they're more important than all the sentences I'm gonna say. Because if the outcome of this is that we come to understand that this is one developmental story for all kids. The only difference is that we sometimes start at different places for different reasons. But if we build learning settings based on a set of whole child design principles, which I'm gonna talk about, what we are gonna see is that those environments can handle kids coming into school with different developmental needs and different developmental starting points. Variation is the core of the human condition. Okay, but it is not, it is not the way our education system was designed. Was designed. Okay. It is, I think, part of what brings teachers into the profession though. Yeah. Um, so what I do, do you think mean we by have, that? I think I think many educators are motivated primarily to help each child thrive. Um, so I do think it taps into motivations, but I, I think the design is, is you're right, very standardized. So to that extent, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna package one set of ideas and you can decide whether you use it or not. Mm -hmm. But I learned about stress and the brain and learning science in around the early 1980s in med school. Okay, think about that. The early 1980s. Okay, and it's now 2020. Mm -hmm. And I have dedicated the better part of the last 10 years mm -hmm. to bringing this knowledge to the education community. Mm -hmm. Now there are many ambassadors. But back in the post 9-11 era when Turnaround was founded, no one was talking about stress and the brain, and no one was looking at children's underperformance in high poverty settings as in any way a consequence of what adversity does to the learning systems of the mm -hmm. brain. So I wondered if this knowledge has, had existed for so long, why wasn't it already mm -hmm. known? Why mm -hmm. wasn't it already embedded? Mm -hmm. So. I've looked into that and as a set of structural fallacies, and I'm just gonna tell you five, but I have mm -hmm. plenty more. <laughs> the first is one of the things we already talked about, that in the early part of the 20, 20th century, we believed that genes were the drivers of who we become, including our intelligence. Today we know that intelligence is malleable, mm -hmm. Okay, and that our environments and experiences are the determinants of who we become. We believed that talent was scarce, that it was distributed as a bell curve with most people falling into the middle with a few talented people in the tails that we have to go and find. And once we go and find them, we can put them on a pathway so that they get to the good colleges and the good jobs. Talent is not scarce. Mm -hmm. Talent is actually plentiful. It's not standardized, and it doesn't exist in society as a bell curve. We believe that an average, an average score, average height, average speed, stood for an individual score. Now we know that an average rarely represents the, imp the individuals that are averaged mm -hmm. in that score. And Todd Rose's book, The End of Average, is an extraordinary explanation mm -hmm. of this point. We also believe that a factory model dependent on lots of memorization was a good and efficient way of educating children. But today we know that engagement and agency matter far more to skill building and mastery level competencies and higher order skills. And finally, the fifth, we believe that the potential of a child was knowable in advance. 
-hmm. And today we know that you can't see the potential of a child unless you put that child in a context that was designed to reveal who they are. One of the things I often say in my speeches is that if a Malala, a Martin Luther King, or a Mozart were in many of our classrooms the way our classrooms are designed today, it's possible we wouldn't know they were there because the classrooms are not designed to reveal them. So these, these are just five of the underpinnings of 20th century design, but they help us see a roadmap for where we need to go in 21st century design, which assumes talent is plentiful, mm -hmm. lots of kids have it, kids don't learn the same way, learning is very, all learning is variable, and how we design settings is actually going to determine that many, many more kids will thrive in learning settings. Mm. And that's what we're going to talk about. It's so interesting to me in so many ways but for the first time i feel like it's um uh, i have thought that this pandemic is cracking schools open in ways that actually could allow for some fundamental redesign i haven't thought until this conversation that the pandemic is creating a context that actually allows students to reveal their potential in new ways and i'm finding that very powerful and I, I am glad you're seeing that because that's what, that's what I see as well. Hmm. Um, do you I want to be a... careful not to, you know, glorify hardship at the same time. Um, well, but just because we're having fun now, and if you <laughs> have, if you have the time, mm -hmm. um, let me tell you another story that's Please. Mm -hmm. really kind of interesting. So there was this famous marshmallow test, you know, mm -hmm. where in the 70s and these kids in the nursery school were put in a room with a marshmallow and they were told if you could delay eating this marshmallow for 15 minutes, you would get a second marshmallow. Mm -hmm. And Walter Michelle and the data from that, he drew these correlations between the people, the kids who could have that self-control and everything from higher SAT scores, high school graduation, college acceptance, mm -hmm. and even later life success. Mm -hmm. So then there's this researcher whose name is Dr. Celeste Kidd. She was at the University of Rochester, it was 2012, and she had worked in a homeless shelter. And she said to herself, would any of my kids have ever waited to get that second marshmallow? So she decided to repeat the test Mm -hmm. under a different set of conditions. And she brought the kids into a room with a bunch of broken crayons on the table. And she said, I'm gonna come back and give you a brand new set of crayons. And with half the kids, that's what she did. With the other half, she came back and she said, sorry, I couldn't get the crayons after all. Then she repeated the marshmallow test. And what do you think happened? Well, the kids where the promise was kept no problem. These are homeless kids. Yeah. No yeah. problem waiting, waiting, waiting to get that second marshmallow. The kids where the promise was broken gobbled up that first mar marshmallow right away. That was trust. Which grew from trust, right? That it turns out it, that the kids had the capacity for self control, the capacity for self management in the environment designed to reveal it, hmm. meaning the presence of a person they trusted. So when you think about what this means for the environments that we could design that would actually reveal the skills that kids actually have, or think about the environments where we don't see and can't see the skills and talents of our kids, because the environments actually aren't designed mm -hmm. to reveal them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for kids from vulnerable communities, kids who are marginalized, kids, kids who are oppressed, they are often the kids that experience themselves as invisible mm -hmm. in the systems that we have. So, <laughs> yeah. very, very powerful. Um, 
to close, I'm wondering if you could, if you have another minute or so, if you could paint a picture of your worst fear about September and your biggest hope. So, again, I, I, every time you ask me a question, I have to um, start off to put it into some context. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things we've established is that the brain is malleable. Mm -hmm. So everything I tell you about my best hope derives from that point. Mm -hmm. There is nothing inherently in a child that can't be grown with the right relationships, the right experiences, and in the right environments. But a brain under stress is shut down. Mm -hmm. It struggles to focus and concentrate, doesn't have a lot of working memory, and is easily triggered by emotions. Many kids that we see in September are going to be just like that. Mm -hmm. And the way our brains are wired, it is our emotions that drive our cognitive and learning skills. It is our emotions that engage us or shut us down. We know this, mm -hmm. all of us know this. Mm -hmm. So today in the time of COVID and violence and racism and inequity, today we have no choice. Okay, we've thought we had a choice about mm -hmm. what to prioritize. Today we have none. Mm -hmm. The path to a calm classroom is a calm brain. The path to learning is a calm brain. And the path to both of these is to prioritize activities that build relationships, build consistent routines, mm -hmm. and build resilience. Relationships are the active ingredient in any learning environment because they are the way trust is built and they are literally the fuel for the connections between brain structures that have to happen to build a complex skill. Mm -hmm. Just reading alone is at least five different structures in the brain becoming wired mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. But the energy that moves those neurons is coming from relationship. It's coming from emotions mm -hmm. engaging us. Mm -hmm. This is what Mary Helen Imordino Yang's work is all about. The brain also is a prediction ma machine. The brain loves to always know what's coming next. It's very orderly and it gets agitated, okay, when things are unpredictable. So classrooms that have routines that kids can count on, Mm -hmm. where kids can establish norms with their teachers, where there are prompts all over the room that give kids many different cues about what is expected of them, what they can do, where there are routine planners both for the day, but also for kids themselves, that they always know what's coming next. Mm -hmm. All of that will be very helpful to them. Mm -hmm. And the key to building resilience and this is such an interesting thing. But if you talk to a person of color and they say, well, you don't think I have resilience? What do you think it means for me to live in my community or walk to my school every day? I've got plenty of resilience. True. But resilience can be adaptive or maladaptive. And we only want to build adaptive resilience. So a young person can be a leader by having a very powerful personality that disrupts an entire class, but you work with that same child to build their regulatory skills so they know how to use that leadership for a good purpose, what you're gonna see is not just better learning and not just better behavior in class, but more adaptive resilience building skills. Mm -hmm. So Turnaround and I, as their science mm -hmm. advisor, crystallized a giant amount of science into those three words. Mm -hmm. And our website is loaded with resources for very specific practices 
and tools, all of which are open source, to support teachers in applying those practices in their classrooms in September. So I would strongly, strongly urge um, your audience yeah. to just go get those resources. They're really, really wonderful and sticky and, and easy, easily usable. That is great. I look forward to um, including them in this transcript. And I know you also mentioned a fuller keynote, uh, I believe oh, called yeah. Lear Learning in the Brain, yep. um, that we will also link to. Um, Let me tell you a couple of other things. Please. Um, because I was told you wanted to know who else you who should Who else be to learn from. from. Mm -hmm. So our 180 podcast is actually like what you're doing mm -hmm. now. We did mm -hmm. podcasts with visionary leaders um, like Jim Shelton, Todd Rose, mm -hmm. Naila Nas uh, Nasir, Karen Pittman, Margaret Beale Spencer. So our 180 podcast is really in many ways a journey through everything we're talking about mm -hmm. now to reimagine what our education systems could be. For understanding racial identity and, um, and the consequence of this trifecta of challenges, I would say anything that Margaret Beale Spencer is writing about that relate to context, including the context of the police. It, her work is extraordinary. She's at University of Chicago. Same for Naila. Naila Saud Nasir is the head of the Spencer Foundation, but she used to be head of African American Studies at Stanford. And her work on African American identity, hugely important. Um, John King, you have mm -hmm. another person that you may want to check out that wouldn't easily come across your path, but I've done a couple of talks with him is Phil Fisher, the S Center for Translational Education in Oregon. And Phil created this amazing survey where basically he is getting a snapshot about how kids are and families are doing in real time, every week across the country. Mm. So you can, it, it, all of his data is published on Medium. Mm -hmm. But if you, let's say you're in Tennessee and you want to get a snapshot of mm -hmm. how parents and kids are doing in Tennessee, you can go you can to isolate. His, Fascinating. I, and mm -hmm. I've done now two talks with him. Mm -hmm. So having him as a speaker mm -hmm. would also be, I think, really interesting for you. So last thing is, what am I worried about? My biggest worry is that there has been so much strain on families and our system that it could take the easy way out and snap back mm -hmm. to old things that are tried and true and easier. Um, my gut tells me that we have a better shot than ever before mm -hmm. of making transformational change. But I am very worried um, about something I saw in 9-11 happening. So I just want to give you the down picture. Mm -hmm. In 9-11, we knew that we had nowhere near the mental health capacity to serve the kids who needed mental health services in, mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. We were sure with all the philanthropic money that we had gotten mm -hmm. that we were going to change the mental health system forever. We didn't. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's worse now than it was mm -hmm. then. Okay. So, so a crisis does lull you into some belief that you will finally make the changes that you've known mm -hmm. had to be made for a long time. That, of course, is my hope. Mm -hmm. But the other possibility is when the heat's off, um, the system Snaps goes back. back to its more mm -hmm. comfortable place. I'm certainly going to be one of many people fighting to keep that from mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you are too. Thank you so much for all you've shared today. I've learned so much and um, I am inspired by um, what what you have taught me. 
um, and I, I sign up for Team uh, Pave a New Way. Thank you very much, Dr. Pamela Cantor. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you.